Sir Henry Morgan, a privateer and a plague to the Spanish in the 1600s. Just when the Spanish thought they were done with Sir Francis Drake's exploits, now they had to contend with another devil fighting for the glory of England. Morgan was born a Welshman sometime in 1635, but little is known about his early life. It's speculated that Morgan dropped out of school at a very early age, for he was more accustomed to the pike than he was with books. It's likely that as a young adult, he would travel to the Caribbean as part of an army sent by Oliver Cromwell to vanquish the Spanish in the West Indies. However, other reports indicate a less than honourable start for Morgan's career. He may have served as a mere apprentice to a cutlery maker in exchange for his emigration. A more insidious report indicates that Morgan was captured and sold as a servant into the Caribbean. Whatever his method of arriving in the Caribbean, Morgan would go on to work for Sir Thomas Modiford, the governor of Jamaica in 1664. Modiford would be instated to limit the activities of privateers and keep them in check, which he declared openly. However, he went back on his word shortly after when economic problems would present themselves. Joining a few other captains, Morgan would serve as a privateer, plundering Spanish cities and settlements in the Caribbean, to which they acquired large amounts of valuable cargo. Modiford took note of their efforts and would be most impressed. In 1667, the relations between England and Spain were growing worse. There were also whispers through Jamaica that there would soon be a Spanish invasion. Fearing such an outcome, Modiford issued Morgan the instruction to seek out the Spanish in hopes of obtaining information. In 1668, Morgan would be granted the rank of Admiral and assembled 10 ships with 500 men. He set sail to attack Portobello, now modern day Panama, and would seek to justify raiding and looting as a means to find out the information that Moniford had asked for. Portobello was known as one of the main routes of trade, and so Morgan believed that here would be a prime area for which to attack and amass riches. But Portobello was protected by two castles in the harbour and a third castle in the town centre, making it quite troublesome to conquer. To make matters worse, 200 of his French privateers decided that they were unhappy with the way in which Morgan had divided the loot from previous raids. They were also unhappy at how one of their own men was murdered by another Englishman of the crew, despite the fact that Morgan would see him personally hanged for his crimes later on. With all this in mind, the French took their share of the spoils and abandoned Morgan, reducing his number to around 300 men. Morgan was able to take the first two castles by approaching from a landward side and catching the Spanish occupiers off guard. Morgan sustained a few losses and was left at odds when trying to control the third and final castle. Not only was he outnumbered, but his crew were beginning to realise the dire situation that they were in and their morale was sinking fast. Morgan knew he had to come up with an idea, and so he did. Alexander X. Kremlin, a 17th century historian who was travelling with Morgan at the time, wrote that Morgan would kidnap priests and nuns and in an audacious ploy would use them as human shields. He was able to put fear into the holy citizens and ordered them to set up ladders on the side of the castle walls so that he and his crew could ascend. His ploy, dastardly as it was, worked like a charm, for the Spanish resistance ceased fire for fear of wounding the civilians. Funnily enough, Morgan later sued ex Kremlin for misrepresentation of his character and the section about him using holy men and women as human shields was withdrawn in later publications of the book. Morgan soon gained control of the third castle having used the priests and nuns to his advantage. He and his crew remained in Portobello for a month, where Morgan held the city ransom for 350,000 pesos. The crew stripped the town for all it was worth, and ex Kremlin would claim that both Morgan and his crew became barbaric, raping and beating everything in sight. However, by this point, it should be noted that Ex-Kremlin had developed a personal disliking for Morgan, and so many have disputed his observations at Portobello, saying that they had been exaggerated. Morgan would leave Portobello after negotiations, and both he and his crew would become very wealthy. It should be noted that back home in Britain, word of Morgan's expeditions would be spread, and he would be hailed as a hero. Morgan soon moved on to his second expedition at Colombia, where he would attack the settlement known as Catarina de Indias a very wealthy city of the Spanish main. Modiford learned of Morgan's intentions and so sent him a vessel known as the Oxford to aid him in his conquest. Morgan called a war meeting on board the Oxford, consisting of all of his captains. However, 
A freak accident with the ship's gunpowder caused a spark, and a massive detonation tore apart half of the ship, and 200 of the crew. Morgan and the captains who sat on one side of the table in the war room were blown into the water. The other half were blown to smithereens. Now at a loss that his new flagship was out of commission, a French pirate who once served with the pirate Francais Lolloné suggested approaching Maracaibo through a shallow lagoon that they had discovered. Morgan agreed, and they set sail to Maracaibo, only to find that the first fortification was deserted of the expected Spanish soldiers. After a thorough search, Morgan soon found a slow burning fuse that would lead up to the fort's powder kegs. Evidently, the Spanish were expecting pirates and had set this up as a trap before abandoning the settlement. Morgan made his way into central Maracaibo and plundered all that he could. Escapees were chased into the forest and tortured until they revealed more of where their treasures were hidden. Once satisfied, Morgan set sail for Gibraltar, where he spent five days torturing and plundering. Upon leaving Gibraltar, Morgan would be forced to return when Spanish defence squadron known as the Armada del Belavento was waiting for him at the same narrow passage in which he had used to enter. The Armada del Belavento had 126 cannons for which to destroy Morgan and his ships. Negotiations were made between Morgan and the commander of the Armada, Espinosa, but each stipulation put forth by Espinosa would require Morgan to leave his plunder and slaves behind and leave empty-handed. Morgan turned to his crew and asked them what they would want to do. To them, the choice was simple. They would fight or die. Outshipped, outgunned and outmanned, Morgan needed a way in which to disrupt the armada which awaited him and escape with his riches. The crew would end up deciding to send a fire ship to greet the armada, specifically aimed at Espinosa's flagship, the Magdalen. For those of you not sure what a fire ship is, it's very much what it sounds like. It was a common navy tactic used against the Spanish in the 17th century, where an empty vessel would be lit on fire and steered in the direction of the enemy. The aim was to destroy enemy ships, but it served equally well to create panic and break up formations. Additionally, the crew prepared a ship and added vertical logs with wigs to make the Spanish believe it was full with people. Grappling irons were laced into the ship's rigging to entangle it with the Magdalen, rendering it useless. During the attack, the fire ship worked so well that the Magdalen caught fire as well. The other ships in the Armada became so disorganised that Morgan's men were able to storm aboard and seize control. It was said that including the plundering of the Magdalen that Morgan would salvage, he and his crew amassed 250,000 pesos and a large number of slaves. He also acquired 500 heads of cattle from the Maracaibos in exchange for not sacking the town. Morgan still needed to make his way past the fort, which would destroy his ships as he tried to leave. A devious plan was put in place, where his men faked a landing at Maracaibo, causing the Spanish to abandon the fort and rush to prevent an English assault on the land. While they were busy doing that, Morgan and his crew were able to sail away and into the night, completely unscathed. And with all the loot too. Morgan would commit to his third and final major raid in 1671 at Old Panama City. He was commissioned by Modiford once more, and given a fleet of 30 ships. Morgan and his crew made most of their way to the old city on foot through a swamp, but the governor of Panama was forewarned of a potential attack, and sent Spanish troops to intercept Morgan. Morgan and his men were able to defeat the forces sent after them, who were said to be considerably less experienced in combat. In one last ditch attempt to stop Morgan, the governor of Panama released bulls into the battlefield. However, the gunfire and the sounds of battle scared the bulls so much so that they turned around and trampled the Spanish soldiers to escape. In the end, Morgan had only lost a dozen or so men, but there were between four to five hundred Spanish soldiers killed. After Morgan's victory, the governor of Panama ordered the detonation of the city. It was reported that the fires would last an entire day and only a few buildings remained of the city after the fallout. Morgan and his men spent three weeks taking what they could from the ruins. It's been disputed, but Morgan's taking from Panama ranges from between 100 to 400,000 pesos. Alexander X. Kremlin noted that the crew's efforts were not reflected in their pay, and they were dissatisfied with their earnings. He also states that Morgan left with most of the loot to himself. Morgan's success wouldn't end here, however. He would be later knighted by King Charles II in 1674, 
and sent out as deputy governor of Jamaica, where he lived a wealthy life. Morgan was buried at Palacedos Cemetery at Port Royal, leaving behind a fortune of three plantations, 129 slaves, and his own personal wealth of £5,263, which would equate to around half a million pounds nowadays. On June 7, 1692, an earthquake struck Port Royal, and the Palacedos Cemetery where Morgan was buried fell into the sea. Morgan's body has never been recovered. So I think we can all agree that Sir Henry Morgan sure had an exciting career. What was your favourite moment from his cunning battles on the sea? Maybe the human shield wall of nuns and priests? Or perhaps the single fire ship that sent a fleet of 120 guns into a frenzy? Let me know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe. Our next pirate was said to have buried all of his treasure, but to this day it has never been found. Until the next time.